scared off most of the crowd. So, or else they're eating. I was looking, first of all, my name is Chip Rogers. I want to really thank uh, Joe for allowing me to come back and play a very small part in some of the work that's being done by what I consider to be um, the cutting edge legislative body in the United States. I often wonder why Heartland isn't actually bigger than it is because they're the only ones going to really take on issues in a way that, uh, that gets the truth. And I know, even though I haven't been here all day, I've been to about 10 of these, and I know exactly what, uh, what transpires, so I appreciate their willingness to take on issues and, uh, and actually have people that are, that are willing to talk about change in a, in a positive direction. Um, as I look through the, uh, the issues for them, I was struck by the fact that so far you guys have talked about budget and taxes, and energy and environment, health care, and then we're closing up with education. And I think that's appropriate because realistically, the issue of education, in my opinion, overshadows the rest of it. Now, why do I say that? Because the challenges that we face as a nation, and I'll, I'll give you an example of, a, of an interaction that probably everybody in this room has had a thousand times, and a thought that you've had probably a million times. When you're talking to one of your friends who may be on the other side of the, of the ideological uh, spectrum, how many times have you said to yourself, if I just had the opportunity to sit down and explain to them how this works, they would surely agree with me because I know that I'm on the right side of the issue, whether it's tax reform, the environment, health care, or anything like that. How many times have you said, if we could just sit down and talk to somebody about how bad nationalized health care is, we could certainly convince them that our position is right? Well, that's why I believe education is the most important issue, but also, without question, the biggest wasted opportunity that we are seeing across the United States right now. My greatest frustration at the time that I was uh, blessed to serve in the General Assembly was not being able to do far more than what we were able to accomplish in Georgia as it pertains to education reform. Because I'll make this very simple statement, then we'll get into the, uh, into the event. And that is, is, if we have a society that is properly educated and liberal, understands it, practices it, values it, and votes for candidates that stand for liberty, all these other issues that we're talking about become so less important. They become so less divisive, and they become so less onerous. And we are missing all of this because we have given up, in many cases, and I think every legislator that's in here has probably fought this battle to a certain degree and, and felt that we're not going where we ought to go. But we've given up in a certain, to a certain degree to a, almost a government monopoly in the, in the area of education. And I have so many good, good friends, none of them are in this room right now, but good, good friends who will go home and stand on a, behind a podium like this with a microphone and talk about how conservative they are and how they're for personal responsibility and how they're for empowering parents and empowering individuals, and yet when the, the notion of even suggesting that we change the government monopoly known as education is presented to them, and when their local school board chair calls them or the local superintendent calls them, you would be amazed at how quickly they cower that pressure. Just absolutely amazed, and that, I guess um, my greatest disappointment was seeing people that I have great respect for who stand and hold the conservative banner, except to the point where we begin to talk about education. So my challenge to you today is to hear this dialogue and ask yourselves the, the, the simple question, why are we not doing more? If you actually believe in liberty, why are we allowing this to continue in the United States where 95% of the children literally have no choice? And then ask yourself, if they have no choice, and the people who have given them no choice, what do you think is being taught in those classrooms? Probably not what we in this room stand for. So, I asked for a couple minutes to get on my soapbox, and they were kind of have to give it to me, so I appreciate that. <laughs> um, my guests today on the panel are, uh, are, are three very wise people that are going to help explain this to us, and I'm going to have some actually pretty tough questions for them, because... Uh, now that I'm not in office anymore, I have the freedom to say pretty much anything I want. <laughs> and, and that's that sort of stopped me before. Yeah, that didn't stop me much before. But um, first is my dear friend Jamie Lord, and I don't know how many times she and I have sat in the same room and had that exact conversation that we just had uh, over the last decade. And, and I'm not going to go through her bio. It's just suffice it to say that when there is an issue of giving parents more control of the educational future of their children in Georgia, this lady is standing front and center every single time, and I, I have always appreciated that for her. Uh, next to her is Representative John Berry, and he is from the wonderful state of Tennessee. And uh, Representative Berry, thank you for being with us 
Thanks for having me. And next to him is Eric Cockling, and Eric is with an organization that, if nothing else, has an incredible name, the Georgia Center for Opportunity. And so, uh, and I'm sure it's had much greater value than just that. So we, the only thing I can find bad about Eric is this graduating from the University of Georgia. Other than that, uh, as my good friend Buzz Brockway, my other fellow Yellow Jacket here would attest, that um, I guess it's an okay school. Um, oh, I want to start with, again, I have the ability to ask some fairly tough questions. I want to start with, with this, and I want all three of you to answer if possible. And that is, if we know that giving parents more choice is good for the students, and we know that it's good for the parents, and we know that it provides a better education, and we know that it actually costs less money, and we know that if you ask any parent, do you want your child to have more choices or less choices, that universally they'll answer more choices. If we know all those things, then why are we where we are in the state of American education today? I mean, if it makes sense across the board with every question you ask, why can't we get laws changed to provide more, more choice for children? Jane? I guess I'll start. Um, it's a good question. I think I ask it myself uh, regularly. I think there are two potential answers. One is I don't know that everyone um, understands the points that you just made. I don't know that everyone understands um, that uh, academic outcomes are better for children, that it does cost less money, that parents are more invested in a child's education when they're given opportunities to choose where that child is educated. Um, I, I think there's still a lot of education that needs to happen, uh, particularly among elected officials, not so much the general public. We get that we want to make choices for our own children and in all areas of life, not just education, but that's so important. I think the other real answer is um, is politics, right? I think that at least the difficulty for me as a lobbyist is that there are a lot of legislators who fundamentally probably even understand <coughs> this is the right thing to do, but because they are concerned about being reelected um, and their local school superintendent or school board members um, start making pay for them in the district, if they start talking about school choice, as you well know, um, it, it becomes a fight, it's uncomfortable, uh, you might get a you know, an opponent in an election. You might have somebody raise money against you. The thing that I, I would like to educate legislators on is uh, nationwide, it is rare, if it's ever happened, I'm actually not aware of it, that candidates lose on this issue because the public, once educated, they do get it. I mean, this polls, at least in our state, I mean, close to 80%, you talk about 80, 20 issues, this is one of them in our state. Uh, so it's a winning thing. I just think the mentality among elected officials is that it's not, or that it would be risky, or that it's going to make you have to run uh, a campaign that you would rather not have to run. Um, but I, I think those are the those are my takeaways. And Representative Barry. Well, I, I too agree. It's a very good question. I think that first of all, I think we're going to have to have the collective guts to really look at the issue. Uh, and, and be realistic with ourselves and swallow a bitter pill that many of us don't want to swallow. And that is that we have allowed education to, to deteriorate in this nation to the point that we're producing an inferior product uh, than the rest of the world. At some point in time, we have to face that and then ask ourselves, what do we need to do to turn it around? And we have never had anything that is successful in this country without having the public involved. We want to make public policy without public input. At some point, we got to go back to the parents. It's their children. Ultimately, they are responsible. If the kids are failures, if they are caught in, in the uh, uh, system, if they are uh, in jail, if they can't read and write, uh, people blame the parents. Uh, but they have less input and less to say about how their children are educated than anybody. So I think that basically what has to happen is we, we've just got to go back to what made America great in the first place. When I was a kid, we had uh, community schools. We had a public school that was right across the street. We stayed within our community. We went to our schools. So of course, we had our issues in the 50s and 60s that we had to solve. But one thing is for sure, in those schools that would be called inferior today, we produce a product that could read, could write, could think. We sent a man to the moon, I say everywhere I go, uh, with uh, 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 a, a pencil and a paper, a slide rule, and a computer that would fill up this room that doesn't have as much uh, memory as my cell phone because we taught folks to think. At some point, we've got to get back to that, and we've got to stop trying to maintain the status quo, make all of the associations happy, and look at the fact that 
too many of the children, once they've been to school 12 years, they can't read, they can't write, they cannot compete with the rest of the world. So we gotta come back to the basics, and that is to educate our children. May I say this before, uh, I, I'm quiet. There's an acrostic uh, uh, for fear, and I, probably everybody in the room knows it, false evidence appearing real. The false evidence is put out there. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, the parents' ability to choose and to think for themselves and for their children is put out there, and basically it's insulting to tell the parent that they don't have sense enough to decide how they want their child to be educated. Seen Khan Academy, check it out. But 
the whole issue of digital learning is probably the area that I know I'm most excited about as a reformer because it really changes the question of what we're talking about. For 20 years, I've been going around talking about school choice, right? It's no longer school choice. We can, we can throw, throw that away. It's now class choice. You literally get to choose what class you want. And the multitude of providers that can offer you the classes that you, as, as a student or as a parent, want for your student. So talk a little bit about digital learning, where we're heading with, it, with this. And it seems to be the one area of choice that we get the, the, the least pushback on, because even those who are against choice recognize that the future is through a digital format. Okay. Yeah, one thing I was thinking when Eric was talking about um, just how we sort of become comfortable with the monopoly in education. It, I've heard other people say this along the way. If you were, if we didn't have a system in place right now, and we said, go design a delivery mechanism for educating the public, nobody would come up with what we have currently. This has just happened over time, because it's happened over time, and then you have a lot of people, and then you have a lot of jobs that are at stay. It, it, it's just happened to us. It's not something that I think anybody set out uh, public education was done on purpose, and that was a worthy goal to educate the public. But how it's done, um, I think, is something that has just evolved, and we've all just gotten used to it, and suddenly it doesn't work, or we're recognizing suddenly that it doesn't work, um, and we need to make changes, and that's difficult. I think the, the great thing about digital learning and the opportunity that it provides is this is just new territory. So while I do think there's a lot of agreement that, um, that you should be able to choose classes, uh, and then it's just a matter of figuring out the mechanism for how to pay for it and how to make it happen uh, for students. You know, are they getting that delivery in a school setting, at home, somewhere else? And does it really matter? And I think people are a lot more open-minded because it doesn't exist, well, until recently, it doesn't exist. So they're just not used to a way of doing it. And so we're all uh, a little more comfortable with trying to figure out what that might look like uh, in the future. And, and I think that's great. I think it's a great uh, opportunity for us. Representative DeBerry, or for Eric. Yeah, I, I think the uh, the digital space is really, I mean, talking about Clayton Christensen and his, his book on constructive innovation, um, that's something we're not exactly all sure where it's going to end up and what it means, but I think these questions um, related to the cost of education and the opposition and the choice um, opportunities that we, we've put forward so far, and opposition we've seen on that based on money going from the public system and gunning it for the claims that we get the system. I think when we talk about digital learning, the cost of that is going to be so much less, and it's already proven to be that way, that those types of arguments will not have so much play anymore. So I think politically it's going to provide us with uh, an opportunity. Representative DeBerry, tell us about some of the things that are happening in Tennessee. Well, I think the one of the main things happening in the state of Tennessee is we're talking about education. We're talking about it uh, from the standpoint of individual choice, of parent trigger, of vouchers, of digital education. We're, we've opened the door to, uh, we don't have to uh, follow a system that apparently some folks thought was dropped down from heaven uh, with, uh, with no, no issues and no problems. The main thing happening in the state of Tennessee, and I've got some of my colleagues in the room, uh, is that we realize that we don't have the luxury of continuing what we're doing. Uh, that we can't lose another generation. I tell people everywhere I go, everybody talks about the lost generation, but nobody wants to talk about who lost them. And it's our responsibility to say that we lost them, and then figure out how we lost them, and then fix it. And talking about the, uh, the digital issue, uh, just uh, that you, you brought up a moment ago. We, we talked about this and we've had several companies in the state of Tennessee who have done this. Some have been very good, some have been very bad. But you know, we can't judge uh, a, a system by the fact that some have failed. If we do that, then uh, you know, how, who failed more than our current education system if we, if we use that criteria of judgment. So uh, I think that is like anything else. You, you keep an open eye, a receptive mind, you, you, uh, you look at skill, aptitude, all around fitness, and you make a decision on each company by the merits of its performance and, and what it turns out. And you do that across the board. With digital, you do that with, with, with uh, your charter schools, you do that with everybody. If you use that criteria, then everybody's going to have to stand on their own merit. And you raise a good point. I remember being interviewed, um, I don't know how they do it in Tennessee, but here in Georgia, my fellow legislators were, 
will appreciate this. We often get every two years invited to come speak to our local uh, Georgia Association of Educators group. And uh, I knew that the chances of me ever getting their support was like less than zero. But I always attended because I actually wanted to have a dialogue with them. And I remember a teacher once telling me, well, these charter schools that you support so much are terrible because some of them have actually closed down and gone out of business. I said, exactly right, that's what we want to happen. And she looked at me with utter amazement because the notion of actually closing a failing school to her was just, you know, it's like walking on Mars. And I said, that's what we want. We want every bad school, public or private, to actually close. And in the private sector, that's actually what happens because if you're bad, you can't stay in business. But on that issue of charter schools, how do we prevent, and, and this is a fear that I've had while I've been a great proponent that many in this room have of charter schools, how do we prevent charter schools from becoming a watered down version of what we have now? But I, mean, I, I, I think if you look at the uh, charter schools in Georgia, I don't know how this plays out around the country. I'm not sure it's very similar. They are governed by a contract with the state or with their, their local district. And if they're not living up to it, uh, they shut down. And that's just how it's been, how it is, and how I hope it continues. Um, I think on issues that probably get the Common Core, but there are issues around Common Core that I think could drive charter schools to become much more like traditional public schools and lock into how they teach things based on teaching the tests and so forth. Um, but I think the, the very structure, the incentive structure that we like to talk about when we're talking about the free market and how that operates, that is alive and healthy in our charter school system. And as long as the money and the existence of those charter schools is tied to the outcomes that we really want, which are, you know, higher graduation rates, higher competency, and, I think the vitality of that side of the house will remain strong. I think it comes down to autonomy. And we have something in the state of Georgia, I'm not sure that this exists anywhere else, but um, called charter systems. And I think the big difference between a charter system and an independent charter school is just that word, independent. Uh, a charter system that is basically an extension of the, uh, of the school system is just a different way of explaining um, a, a public school system. Maybe there's a little more flexibility, and, but I think that there's two ingredients in a charter school. There's flexibility and there's autonomy. And if you have to have the autonomy piece to really make it any different than a watered down version of, of what we have now, I think some of the charter systems are great, but they resemble a lot more of a watered down public, you know, traditional public school than an innovative autonomous, autonomous uh, charter school. So I think we have to guarantee uh, in the laws that we have that authorize charter schools, that the independent charter schools can be independent. One more question. I'm sorry, Professor. Other than the government itself and those institutions that are uh, connected to it, what organizations or institutions are allowed to exist when they fail? You can't. If, if, you, if you fail in your business, it closes. If you don't get customers, value is not perceived uh, in the eyes of, of a provider. Value is perceived in the eyes of the recipient or the customer. So no matter how good you think your hamburgers are, if nobody buys them, you're going to go out of business. When we've got institutions and we've got schools, the parents are not happy, uh, the community is not happy, and we continue to fund these failing institutions uh, under the idea that if we don't, then the country's going to fall apart. Well, that's just, that's just insanity. And at some point, we're going to have to come up to a point to where everybody's held uh, to a standard to where they have to produce uh, uh, an educated person. And if you don't produce an educated person, you're not doing your job. I think your comment on it doesn't matter how good you think your hamburgers are placed perfectly into the comments that you'll often hear from those of the education bureaucracy. I mean, I've talked to people that work for school systems with a local graduation rates, 60%. They'll tell you about how wonderful their system is. I, just, I look at them in utter amazement. Four out of 10 kids aren't even graduating. How could that ever be classified as a successful system, but in their own mind, they, they, they believe it is. Now, before we go to questions, I want to talk uh, about Common Core, because that is a, uh, that's one of those issues that uh, those on the, I'll call it the right side of the, the spectrum, are caught a little bit in the quandary, because most are totally against any government intrusion whatsoever into the role of, of states. I fully understand that, appreciate that, value that, and support that. But some would also say, shouldn't we have some sort of standard that we're going to invest public money into this grand education scheme? 
should we have some sort of standards that everyone can be measured by so we determine whether that investment is actually making sense? And that is a uh, not the easiest question to answer, even for those who call themselves conservatives. Jamie? Can I make me go first on that one? Um, well, I'm actually going to let Eric speak on behalf of the Georgia Center for Opportunity on Common Core. Um, wearing my American Federation for Children hat, I think what I will say is um, the Federation has supporters on either side of that issue for the very reasons that you mentioned. Some you know, say too much intrusion, everything will end up looking the same, so what's the point of having choice? Uh, and then others say, but we have to have standards, otherwise, I mean, what, what are we doing this for? It's not choice for choice sake, right? It's choice so that our students ultimately are getting a better education and they're better prepared to compete in the world and uh, stay out of jail and get jobs and all of that. So um, American Federation for Children is kind of just not really engaging in that fight. The, the thing that they focus on is providing um, increased opportunities for students to have access to, to private school options, believing that that will drive ultimately uh, drive student outcomes and quality, and we're just sort of not, it's somebody else to blame uh, to navigate the common core issue. So, but since I work for multiple organizations, I'll let Eric handle the GCO, well, and I'll say that on behalf of JSC. Well, in part, I'll have to give a similar disclaimer, but I'm going to tell you what I think. <laughs> Personally, uh, GCO is not taking a position on common core largely because we think it's a distraction from what we are mainly about, which is choice um, and other issues. So we haven't jumped into it. I, I'll say from just this is Eric Cochran speaking. Take it for what it's worth. Uh, the uh, the issue of Common Core, there are lots of problems with it, in my view. I mean, one is the, the mechanism by which we all sort of became beholden to the idea of Common Core. It's federal dollars, lots of it, dangled out as a carrot to the states. Uh, we're all struggling financially at every state is, and it's hard to say no. If you're the legislator that balks at it, you're going to pay the price when it's time for re-election. Right? Uh, the bureaucracy wants it. It's more money. It's seemingly free. Right? Um, I will say that beyond that, uh, Common Core, as it's played out, it's hard to say who's in charge of it. If changes are needed down the road, who do you go to to, to change Common Core? Uh, what if there are problems with it? How does that work out in the end? There's no governing body. A friend of mine, uh, Dr. Eric Warren, uh, does work for the Public Policy Foundation. He's a professor and worked at the Office of Student Achievement at the Governor's Office. Uh, he says this is a, you know, there's there's not a governing body, but beyond that, this common core. What's what really matters here is the testing. Whatever's tested or measured gets done. And a lot of folks have had some issues with maybe the literature requirements uh, within the common core. If the Common Core standard is that you're going to read uh, executive orders, guess what our kids are going to be tested on? Executive orders. And as goes the public school system in terms of what they test, so goes our colleges and what they're going to be looking for and requiring out of their students. So what does that mean ultimately for charter autonomy? Um, and you know, maybe nobody's telling them they have to do it because they want their kids to get into college, they're going to teach to that. Private schools may do the same thing, depending on how strong they are strong they are, uh, and fidelity that they show to their own value. So there are lots of problems with it. Yes, I think we need some, some common standards uh, and testing across states from the standpoint of just knowing how we're doing relative to everybody else and trying to make our country competitive. Making sure all students have a basic understanding of the family documents, can read, can write, can do math, those types of things. But why not do something like the NAEP on a broader scale that is already applied. And over time, the states will teach more towards that if we're going to do something like that. Save the federal dollars, stop the intrusion, and you know, leave state autonomy as it is. Well, in the state of Tennessee, we've adopted a little bit of it. We've got some of it we haven't adopted. We have a lot of folks who like it, and we have some folks who can't stand it, my phone rings off the hooks both, both ways. Uh, but I think that one of the things that public policy makers are gonna to have to do is, is get off the fence. And for a lot of us, uh, we're gonna to have to stop the hypocrisy. At some point in time, we got to decide what we wanna do in order to change this atmosphere uh, as far as education is concerned. And uh, we're gonna to have to monitor and adjust. 
Uh, we, we got in the mess we're in by not touching things we didn't like and not saying things we should have said and not doing things we should have done. We, we sat back and watched stuff happen to us and, uh, and by the time it gets so bad that we can't fix it, then we start screaming bloody murder. Well, here's an opportunity for us if we accept Common Core or uh, uh, it, it, as our state has a part of it and a race to the top to, to be for real, to be, uh, to be legislators, to be leaders, to be educators, to be parents, to say, we don't like this. We don't like this, we want to change immediately. And the only thing that's going to change the education atmosphere in, in America is for uh, those of us who actually, truly want to see change, just, just do what has to be done. Forget the consequences, do what has to be done, uh, or else we're going to pay for it uh, on down the line. A great message for lawmakers. That is, uh, just do what has to be done. If you're not willing to do that, let somebody else do it, I would say. Um, all right, we're going to take questions. And the lovely lady with the microphone has handed it to some people for the first question. Um, I'm Jeffrey Copeland. I'm the new chairman of Young Americans for Liberty for the state of Georgia. Um, I, I guess a little bit of backstory. Like I'm a fourth year at Georgia State University, right down the road. Um, okay, cool. But, um, <laughs> uh, I, I feel that my education did not start until a friend gave me a copy of Economic Tax and Policies by Thomas Sowell two years ago. And I felt like my entire life I had just been coasting by. I was just going through the, the schooling process. So my first question I, I, out of two would be that what do you guys see as the difference between schooling and education and how that culture affects us? And then the second is because of uh, because of the, the terrible job market, uh, the fact that college students aren't able to get jobs once they do graduate, if they graduate, uh, when they have a ton of debt, if they can't get a job, um, how do you, uh, I don't think it's far fetched to say that we have too many students going to college in the first place. So the, I guess the second question is how do we change that culture, if, if you agree with that one? So the first question, just to summarize, was as we move to different forms of education, particularly digital, there is going to be a blurring of lines between, you know, what is formal education anymore, and, and should we be concerned with formal education, or should we just be concerned with learning? I guess I'll say uh, something first. Uh, a good friend of mine in the education reform uh, space is Dr. Howard Fuller, and he has my favorite quote uh, as it relates to this, and that is, um, the purpose of public education should be an educated public, um, not, I think, what we typically think of as what you're describing as schooling. I went to a school from this many hours to that many hours. We talk about seat time and a certain number of minutes per class, and you've got your, you know, do we have PE or not have PE? I mean, ultimately, what is the point of all of this? The point is that people, you know, end up at a certain point in their life educated at least to a certain level. Um, and so I think that is the difference, and I do think that, uh, I'm not sure everybody views it that way anymore. I think it has maybe become more a focus on uh, on schooling than on education itself. Um, and that would be a, a really important shift, I think, in our thinking and how we make policy and just uh, even how we educate teachers and go about administrating schools if people thought more about an educated public as opposed to just a system of delivery for public education. Um, and maybe that's all I need to say about that. I mean, I, I, for me personally, I think it comes down to school should be about three things, whether it's three or four things, <laughs> whether it's K-12 or uh, the college level. It really, it should be about basic head knowledge, you know, can you do fractions, can you do trig, all those things. Uh, but it should be also about can you think, you know, or can you do analytical thinking? Take a problem and break it down and figure out how you resolve it. Uh, but there's, there has to be a component of citizenship within that as well. I mean, that school, is the, school is the place where we have the greatest chance to intervene in a child's life. If things have not been going well up until that point, uh, and they haven't been taught at home things that they should have been taught, school is a great place and maybe the only place outside of our prisons uh, that we have a chance to intervene and sort of change that trajectory. And I'd say in our country, our state, uh, Citizenship, citizenship um, things like family, how to have relationships, all those things can be reinforced more in the schools. And I know that that asks teachers to do way more than one 
many that are doing now, uh, which sort of points, besides the, what should school be about, I think the thing that we've got to come to terms with is the fact that we're asking our teachers to basically, in many cases, replace mom and dad. Um, you guys aren't here to talk social issues necessarily, but I will say that if we want to be honest, right now what we're learning or what we're trying to figure out uh, are two things. Can mothers and fathers and, and stable families be replaced by a government system, i.e. the school, and if they can, how much is it going to cost us? I would say on the first question, we don't know the answer. I think the answer is no. And I think on the other, to the cost, the cost is infinite. There's, there's no amount of money that's going to replace that. Um, so we need to be realistic, I guess, with what we're asking schools to do. We can, we can do some of this, the civics education, we can teach analytical skills, but we can't ask them to be moms and dads. And I think that's where I have a lot of sympathy for teachers, and I want us to be general with our teachers, because I think all the teachers I know, I, know, I don't know about you, they're fully in it. Their hearts are in it. They love kids. They want to make a difference. They're not the problem. Uh, we may be just asking them to do too much and not looking at the source of the problem, which is sort of down the line a little bit with mom and dad. That's a bigger and hairier issue, uh, but it's one worth considering. If there's money invested there, maybe uh, may pay off a lot more than uh, strictly focusing on education. I think we're going to have to get rid of ethnocentrism, basically. One way of thinking, one way of educating, and one direction. Uh, somewhere along the line, we became a credentialed, oriented society where we think that just because people have prefixes and suffixes on their names, that that automatically makes them better than the person who works with his hands and thinks. And I know a whole lot of guys wearing blue uniforms that make more money than guys wearing suit and ties. Uh, at some point, we've got to get back to here again some sanity in our society where we have made there is one path to success. Uh, there is one way to make a living. There is one way to have a, uh, a family that is a successful family as far as being able to afford that family. And I think we're going to have to look, go back to where we were maybe 40 or 50 years ago when educa education was multidimensional. Uh, when, we, when, when teachers knew their students, and they helped direct their students in the directions that made them successful people. They, they paid their taxes, they went to church, they raised their children, they bought homes, uh, and, and, and they made wonderful communities. Many of them never went to college. They never, and if they went, they didn't go four years. They went to community schools, they went to technical schools, they went to uh, schools to learn trades. Uh, let's, let's get this one size fit all education system. Let's lay it to the side. It has failed uh, pitifully. And then let us start looking at people as individuals and, and do what has to be done to make them successful people. And until we do that, we, we're going to chase our tails. Well, you can get applause at 3.30 in the afternoon. You're doing well. <laughs> <laughs> we got time for one more question. We only have time for one more question, and then after we can just stay seated for a little while um, for closing remarks. Um, Barry Fleming, I serve at the State House here in Georgia. Um, something that was mentioned earlier uh, as a subject of my question is that how, how do I help some of my freedom loving colleagues to have investment for to in the legislature to, to vote for freedom in, in liberty and educational choices? Uh, two, two examples to try to illustrate my question. Uh, in 2002 in Georgia, something happened for the first time that anybody can remember that day. An incumbent governor got defeated in the state. And one perception of why he got defeated was right along that he made mad a significant, important political body out there called teachers. He, he, he made them mad. So there was, there, was a, there was a fear of, of doing that again, I think. The second thing that always happens in the state legislatures is I think about seven or eight years, every year we have a bill about the retirement system we don't really and somebody has been a prosecutor and they got elected a judge and their retirement didn't quite flip over right. We have to tweak the law so they can get credit for the years they served as a prosecutor and a judge. The retirement system is a question. So, so my question is, is it possible that if we could get teachers not to be so against choice in education because they fear something, could we help the situation? And, and, and what do they fear? And, and, I, and I wonder if it's job security. What if we could figure out how to allow public school teachers, once they have begun that system, 
as long as they continue to teach, no matter where it is, whether it be a private school, a charter school, or whatnot, that as long as they teach, they can take their health benefits and their retirement benefits with them. Would we then begin possibly, if we could figure out how to do that, and can we do that, was my question, would we begin to eliminate, maybe possibly, some of the opposition to this choice in education because what is it that they really fear? I think it's job security, I wonder anyway. And what is it that legislators really fear? I think it's their opinion. That they fear. Also job security. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? Um, I think it's an interesting idea. I, I would say, from my perspective, um, the biggest opponent that I hate to use us and them and opposition, you know, kind of language, but the people that are the biggest obstacles maybe to actually uh, enacting choice legislation are not necessarily the teachers. I feel like it's their bosses. It's the uh, superintendents and it's school boards and it's the associations that represent them. And I think part of the struggle that we have, and some of you know this better than others um, from our charter amendment campaign, it's not as though we are operating in a world where everybody's dealing with each other straight. We're not talking about facts. Um, but not everybody is. I feel like we are attempting to do that. But what happens is you float a bill like this that will probably not affect the vast majority of teachers in any negative way. Uh, and in fact, it may open up opportunities if there's a you know, uh, greater opportunity for private schools to take more students. Maybe there's jobs put in there that they might enjoy more that don't exist now. Uh, I know my mom would take one now if there were an opportunity for her. But so all that to say, I think it's not negative for teachers, but they're told that it is and they're told that it is by the people who they feel are ultimately responsible for their jobs. And so there's a bit of a fear campaign, there's a bit of an untruth, I guess to put it kindly, campaign that is waged anytime we have a bill out there, um, making teachers fear for their jobs um, and fear for all of the money that's gonna leave the system and leave them educating the worst students with little resources. So I think that's part of what we're combating, and finding a way to get to teachers and get accurate information and maybe provide some incentive to them is, a, is an interesting idea. But they are really not our enemy, quote unquote, um, and most of them get it. They just, they're terrified of their leadership. I think separating labor from management in this case would be infinitely helpful, but we still will have the superintendent problem and the school board problem. Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, the superintendents are largely who we're up against and trying to push these things. They have and it, they don't have tons of money, per se, to uh, wage their campaigns, but they have a black vote that is, you know, massive. And with the press of the send button, they have every teacher and administrator in their area up in arms, uh, with many times complete fabrications. I mean, I'm on plenty of these lists, so I get what they're sending out. And it's unbelievable how uh, blatant they are about lying as to what we're trying to do. Um, I would say we are trying to develop the grassroots components of this that we, we have inroads with teachers, we have inroads with parents, and, and we're getting the truth out at the grassroots level, so we're trying to help there. I think from the standpoint of elected politics, uh, when you look at actually the impact of voting for choice options, and we do this, every time there's a vote on a choice measure, we look at it, especially as it pertains to re-election campaigns. Nobody's losing because they voted for education choice. And if they lose, it's always something else that drives it. We've also done polling that shows that education choice broadly is one of the most popular issues in this state. And we're talking about you know, polling those who go and vote. <laughs> so you know, if we can combat the negative messaging and get the truth out about how it truly impacts the elections, I, I think you can, we can change a lot of people's minds. I think you'd be surprised how many teachers feel trapped in a system that uh, is devouring them and not allowing them to teach. Uh, from my first grade teacher, Miss Riley, uh, uh, in, in, in 1956, I, I remember that woman's name because of the way she conducted her classroom. She was very authoritarian, she was very caring, and she, she put me on a path of learning. Uh, this is what most, most teachers want to do. They feel as though their hands are tied, that, that we as a, a society have stopped disciplining the students and started disciplining the teachers, uh, that they're not protected, uh, that they, they are given documents and, and told they must comply, their students must comply. They have a certain amount of time to 
get this in this kid's head so that there are some tests that will ultimately determine if they get a job next year. Well, I, I think that anything that we can do to help these brave individuals who will go in classrooms of 20 or 30 of somebody else's children, many of whom have not been raised or even taught the basics of manners and morality, uh, and go and stay and do the best they can for eight hours a day to teach them, whatever it takes uh, to empower them, to protect them, to give them the tools they need, and to make them feel that, that this community uh, appreciates them. Uh, I'm all for it. Thank you. So that will end our, our panel. We uh, appreciate it. I'll speak on behalf of all four of us. We really thank you for uh, giving us a few minutes of your time today.